one former, one transformer to rule universe of image segmentation. That's what paper is saying. And apparently that's what paper with code is saying. Five different state-of-the-art badges, nine in total. I cannot even remember if I ever saw a repository with so many SOTA badges at the same time. Apparently the model can solve three different computer vision tasks. So I'm pretty excited to cover that model in the video. We'll run a demo notebook that is part of the repository. And as the cherry on the cake, we'll build a small instance segmentation app that will use the model internally. But before we start, I actually think that it would be useful to cover the difference between instance, semantic and panoptic segmentation. So let's start with semantic segmentation. Models for that task are usually all about clustering together parts of an image that represent the same things, like grass or sky, for example, things that are hard to count. And models of that type will not tell you how many individual objects they see. Instance segmentation models, however, are all about precise detection on the image. So not only they give you a precise pixel perfect mask of every object, but also allow you to count how many of them you see on the image. Panoptic segmentation is basically a combination of those two previous segmentation types. Every pixel on the image gets two data points. The first one is semantic label. The second one is instance ID. The idea here is basically to approach the whole problem more holistically and try to build models that would be capable of solving those two cases at the same time. Okay, enough of the theory, let's take a look at some code. Autos are of the article provided us with the Jupyter notebook that we can open in Google Colab. As usual, the first thing that we will do is we'll save a copy of that notebook on our drive and we should be good to go. Unfortunately, the Jupyter notebook only covers the inference part, not the training part, as it is pretty impossible. By the way, we have an honorable guest on the video today. Leo needs to record the video with me as he hurt his path. So he may be interrupting us from time to time. Hopefully not too often. Okay, as I was saying, the Jupyter Notebook only covers the inference part, not the training part, as the model would most likely require multiple GPUs to train it, and it's pretty impossible to do it in Google Colab. However, it is still possible to train it in the cloud, and we are actually thinking about this kind of video, so let us know in the comments if you would like to see that. And now we should be ready to install the one former into our Python environment. So the first thing that we will do is we will clone the project from the GitHub and then we'll run the second cell that would actually install all required dependencies. Among them, the Tectron 2, which is the base library for that particular model. If you are interested in the Tectron 2, we have a separate video about it that you can watch in the meantime uh, and it should be linked in the card visible in the top right corner right now. Looks like we are done with the installation. So now we can actually start to play around with the model. The first thing that they are asking us to do is to import all required dependencies into the Python environment. Most notably a lot of stuff from the Tektron 2 and from one former. So over here we define a little bit of helper functions. Uh, the first one is actually loading the setup config. This is just the wrapper on top of uh, the Tektron to config files. We load different backbone depending on the configuration. And we run uh, different experiments for panoptic instance and semantic segmentation. Okay, seems pretty straightforward. So let's uh, not waste any more time and run the actual experiments. So the first thing that we will do is obviously load the model into the memory. And when it's loaded, we can actually put it to the test. The first one will be sample image coming from ADE 20K dataset with a panoptic segmentation scenario. So let's press enter and... I can tell you, if you are running that on a CPU, you really need to brace yourself with the patience. So I'm definitely not the patient guy, so I'm thinking, let's restart everything. Make sure that our runtime is GPU accelerated, and it is in our case, and reload everything once again. 
but this time change the configuration of the helper function to run on the GPU instead of the CPU. And after everything has reloaded into the memory, you can actually take a look if the inference is faster with the GPU acceleration. And there you have it. Instead of having like two minutes, we are done in two seconds. Perfect. By the way, take a look at the accuracy of that model. It stuns me every time I'm looking at it. Okay, let's take a look at other examples that they provided. The next one is Cityscape dataset. So similarly as before, we select the type of the backbone, we keep the default one and initialize the model. And after model is loaded into the memory, we can load the sample image from the data set and run the inference. Similarly as before, it should be pretty fast. By the way, we can change the type of the task. By default is panoptic. But how about instance? Cool. I'm really impressed with that model, really. I don't need to reload anything. Everything happens like instantly. And the very last example is coming from Coco dataset. So exactly the same approach as previously. We need to load the model into memory. It takes a little bit of time, unfortunately, but we try to be patient. And after that is done, we can just load the image and run inference. Yeah, I really like that model. So to sum it up, the model is pre-trained on three different data set. You actually need to reload the model to have access to specific data set. But if you want to change the task between panoptic, semantic and instant segmentation, it is happening instantly. You don't need to reload anything. Greetings, traveler. Are you like me, constantly scouring the internet looking for best resources to learn computer vision? Jupyter notebooks, YouTube videos and blog posts? I have something to show you. But seriously, if you're looking for the opportunity to learn more about computer vision, I think that Roboflow Notebooks is a great place for you. We cover anything from image classification to instant segmentation, from old school ResNets for YOLOs up to the latest transformers. Uh, so if you are new to computer vision field or you just look for the opportunity to expand the knowledge about the models that you can use, make sure to give it a try. The link to the repository is in the description below. So I was actually thinking about some use case where we would be able to test and use instant segmentation in some live scenario. And the first thing that comes to my mind is basically to calculate the size, the volume and potentially even the weight of an object. And I have oranges, so we will use oranges. So I'm taking the image of my desk and I'm also putting additional objects with known size on the image so that I can later on reference those and calibrate my script. So I'm thinking the easiest approach would be actually to continue the work in the same Jupyter notebook, just add a little bit of stuff at the very end. So let's start by reusing some of the functionalities that are already accessible within the model. So I'm thinking we'll start by loading the Coco model into the memory. That functionality is already accessible a little bit higher. Let's copy this line, paste it here. You see that it loads predictor and the metadata and the default value for use swing is false. So this will be exactly the value that we will be using. It will take a little bit of time to load. In the meantime, we need to add our own image into the Jupyter Notebook environment. So we will reuse the samples directory that was used by one former and just upload our own image into it. So I prepared a sample image we can now reuse uh, those lines just to make sure that everything loads properly. Yes, and it seems like uh, our image is accessible. 
let me just increase the font size so you would have easier time following what we are coding over here and uh, the next thing that we would do is to actually run the inference on the image just to confirm that our coco model can correctly detect those oranges and bottles on the image ah, and the task in our case is instance segmentation so we can just put it over here the visualization was done for us and sure we can detect oranges and we can detect the bottle we also have access to other detections like keyboard and I guess the person. So the next things that we would like to do is to have access directly to predictions and filter them out by the class. So we can scroll a little bit higher to the place where we defined uh, the tasks and we see instance segmentation run. We copy those two lines, paste them below over here. And now we will have access directly to the predictions. So let's do this. So we are only interested in oranges and bottle because we will use bottle as kind of like this measuring device that will help us calibrate the script. So how do we need to do that? So we need to go to Detectron to instances. And over here we can see that we can filter instances by prediction class. So the only thing that we need to know is what is the class ID of that specific object. We can get that information from metadata. So remember when we loaded predictor, we also loaded metadata and metadata stores information about the data set. And if we print the metadata over here, we see that there is a bunch of useful information, but among other things, think class. So when we go over here and use that property, it will return all the classes from that specific data set. This is simply a Python list, so we can apply index operation on it and pass orange. And that will return us the ID of orange in that specific data set. And similarly, if we will take that, paste it here, and type bottle, it will return us the ID of the bottle in that data set. So now we can actually use the instance filtering to filter out only those objects that belong to those two classes. So let's go back to the documentation, copy this line, go back over here, oranges equals and bottle equals 39. So now what we need to do is calculate the scaling coefficient. Like I said, we will use bottle for scaling. So what we need to do is we need to know how long is the bottle on the image in pixels and how large is the bottle in reality in millimeters, for example. So we can start by calculating the size, the width and height of the bounding box around the bottle because it was specifically located in the way that the edge of the bottle is parallel to the edge of the image. This way, when we calculate the bounding box, it will be very tight around the bottle. If we want to calculate the bounding box around the bottle, we first need to access the masks. So let's do it. We scroll down and do bottle zero that gives us the instance of the actual detections and do pret masks there is a property over here that we can use to access the actual pytorch tensor that contains the mask we need to convert it to numpy array and let's save it in some variable now to calculate the bounding box, we will need to have a int numpy array, not a float numpy array. So let's convert the type. If we would take a look at the shape of that numpy array, we would notice that it has one additional dimension. You can see it over here. 
Let's remove that empty dimension. Now we can convert the mask into the contour. This is basically a different representation of the same thing. Instead of having a beat map with zeros and ones, we'll have a list of points that create the same shape. To do that, I will just copy and paste the right OpenSieve method. And now we can use those contours to calculate the bounding box around the contour. And the width and the height of the bounding box in pixels around our bottle is 78 width and 184 height. Okay, so we know the size of the bottle in pixels. Now we need to calculate the size of the bottle in millimeters. So let me just measure that. And it looks like our bottle has around 155 millimeters. So let's add a variable to store that value. And let's calculate the scaling coefficient. So it's around 0 0.85. That means that whatever value we will get for dimensions of the orange, we will need to multiply that by that coefficient. Let's now go ahead and calculate the dimensions in pixels of our oranges. Now we can take those dimensions and convert them into the millimeters. So expected dimensions of our oranges would be around 83 millimeters and 80 millimeters. Let's take a look what is the size in reality. So the first one is 80 and the other one is 79. I'd say pretty close. That's all for today. If you liked the video, make sure to like and subscribe and stay tuned for more computer vision content coming to this channel soon. My name is Peter. Bye.